so we can start now yeah the youtube uh, link is uh, functioning right right yes yes so dulal uh, yeah. i'll make some announcement about the end semester exam right so mm -hmm. I think some more participants will join in five, five, ten minutes. Maybe you just repeat that at the end of your lecture. Okay. Okay. So, yes. so uh, today we are actually starting the last course of lecture in, in this uh, emerging trend of biophysics, nanobiophysics which will be delivered by Professor Dulal Shinaputi, uh, who is an expert in this field. Uh, what I just wanted to say is that uh, on Monday, 29th November, we will have one quiz, one hour quiz, uh, starting from 4.30 p.m. Uh, that will be multiple choice question type quiz. And that will carry 40 marks. So the time is one hour and there will be a Google form, just like the uh, way we had in our in semester exam. The link will be shared via email and uh, we can also share the link in the chat box here. In addition, uh, that day we will give you a short answer time question. Right, so there will be six topics or six questions. Out of those six questions, you have to choose any two and write a very brief answer, like within 100 words, and that. You may, in fact, uh, give your answer in bulleted form using illustration, flowchart, anything. But it should be very brief and you will be given two days time. So you have to submit the answer uh, via email to that official email address, which will be also mentioned in the question paper by November, uh, December 1. By 1st December 2021. You have to submit the answer. So you can consult the study material, anything, books, internet, whatever. You have to give the answer, very brief answer. Okay, Dulal, now you can start and you can just repeat this uh, announcement at the end of your lecture. Maybe more participants will join later on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Saha. So am I audible, right? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, as uh, Professor Saha mentioned that this is the last topic of this uh, lecture series. So, um, so I'll give, I'll, so the topic is nanobiophysics and uh, I'll give two lectures. Okay, so the first lecture mostly will be introduction and the definitions of nanobiophysics okay and the second lecture which will be on 26th so the day after tomorrow so that lecture will be a little more uh, details about the nanomaterials their synthesis and other things so uh, so this is like one and a half hour lecture so i'll go uh, relatively slowly okay so what is the meaning of this nanobiophysics? Okay, so so the course structure, the first lecture course structure is mostly like what we mean by nanoscale materials. Okay, and how actually that conceptual development of the subject came in our mind, or so like how we actually came from a atomic and molecular domain to finally to the uh, nanoscopic domain so that i'll describe and then uh, briefly i'll go through the historical uh, development of the subject so the historical development means like the 
development in the prehistoric era, so which is before Christ era. And then I will describe in the historic era, which is before uh, 17th century or 18th century. And then the development of modern era, which is starting from the 18th century to the present time. So this P era, how the nanomaterials and their structural things, their application are gradually changing. So that I will describe. And followed by I will describe the definition of nanoscience and nanotechnology and then i'll go to the different approaches of nanomaterial synthesis how we can synthesize those materials. so there are basically two different methods i will describe in detail which are like top down and bottom up i will explain this and then finally i'll go to the unique properties of nanomaterial so like how the nanomaterials their physical and chemical, optical, electrical, and magnetic properties. They depends on like size, shape, surface charge, charge density, and then surface unsaturation. So those things I will explain in details within 1.5 hours. So uh, as I mentioned, like uh, before going into the details so we should have a very clear cut idea about the nanoscale material so the nanoscale which is mostly defined by the scale of the materials or the length scale of the material so the length scale like one dimension of the material it should be in the nanometer scale the nanometer scale means mostly in the stricter sense we define nanomaterials where the one dimension is in within one nanometer to 100 nanometer. But in modern time, the definition has been relaxed a little bit. And then it becomes like one nanometer to 999 nanometer. So just below one micron, everything we define as like nano or nanoscale material. So if you see very carefully, like there are several natural things which we already know or we are going to know. So those are all in the nanoscale. But compared to these natural things, the artificial things or the man-made things is not that many with a dimension of nanometer. So like if you see in the nature, like how actually the dimension reduces, like for an ant, which is about like a millimeter, 10 to the power minus 3 meter. And then if I go down the dimension, the human hair, which is in the hundreds of micro, the diameter. So even if you see a single hair, it's very difficult to see, okay? Or we cannot actually visualize a single hair. And if I go below that, so then it comes like red blood cells, bacteria, okay? Or viruses. So those are like the red blood cell, which will be like seven to eight micron. Okay. And then even still smaller things like a multimetric proteins, okay, DNA chains. So which are in the two to hundred nanometer. Okay. And then if I still go down, then we'll see the naturally occurring silicon crystal, which are spacing of like a below 0 0.1 nano or one angstrom below one angstrom okay but if we see like in that same scale like in the nanometer scale there are not many actually man-made things which are available okay till last maybe like uh, uh, 50 years back also it was very difficult to make the materials whose dimension is in the nanometer scale and only in the recent times, maybe within 50 to 100 years, only people have developed the things like now all of you know, like the like carbon nanotube, okay, fullerene, okay, even the metallic nanoparticles. So those actually one of the dimension, either the diameter or the thickness or, or their uh, radius. So those actually fall in the regime of nanometer. So those things we call as nanoscale okay 
because very simply how we can understand the this landscape so it's like you think about the dimension or the diameter of the earth which is about like 13000 kilometers you just simply you reduce its dimension about like 100 million times so then we will reach to a soccer ball or the football now the football we can nicely you can visualize okay we can feel how big it is how small it is and then still if you reduce its dimension about like 100 million times then actually we reach to the dimension of the one of the first reported nanomaterials which is called as the fullery or the bucky ball okay so you can see so like it's like if you reduce the dimension of like 10 to the power 16 times of earth dimension so then you can reach to the dimension of a nanoscale medium okay and then as i explained in the previous slide you can see like there are several things in that nanometer scale okay so gradually if we reduce from the end and then finally we go, go to the small molecules which are like less than one time okay so those that's the scale where actually we are trying to synthesize the thing okay so the, this subject of this nanomaterials it's not just developed in a single so like so it came from the concept of atoms to molecules and then to different elements and then finally it comes into the uh, concept of the nanomaterials so it was like the first concept of this atoms or atomistic approach of physics so that actually it started long back it's about like 6th to the second century bce where actually ganada ganad or kasapa so who first actually introduced in his ganada sutra so that's the atomistic approach of physics and philosophy so that's what like we believe that the, he was the man who first actually gave a gave an atomistic approach of like the physics or philosophy so then like around the fifth century bc which is recorded by the two greek uh, 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 scientists okay so they actually coined the terms atoms okay so atoms building blocks so matter comes from the atom so when atoms come close to each other so they make something which ultimately gives the material okay so now the atoms when they come close to each other what they give so that actually it came to the idea of dalton who first actually gives the first the modern concept of the atoms so you as a chemist as well as a meteorologist so he gave the first modern atomic theory based on his experiments with atmospheric gases okay and then how the atoms comes close to each other they make the bond and then forms a molecule so that one came around 1811 is given by the avogadro so avogadro first introduced the concept of molecule okay. and then followed by like in 1742 to 1794 so the first modern chemist which is the lavoisier so who first actually introduced okay all the modern chemistry of oxygen carbon silicon so once we know the chemistry of oxygen carbon silicon so that's like the most of the abundant materials in the uh, uh, earth or in the atmosphere so no we, we could know the chemistry of several materials and that was the richest time like the 18th century so that was the richest time of the all over science like not only the chemistry but also physics and other mathematics okay and then as we crossed through the 19th century the 20th century which is actually the peak time for the technology okay but it was like richard Feynman who actually conceptualized the subject of nanotechnology so he was in an annual meeting uh, in a, a physical society in caltech in 1959 so where he told that or he proposed that there are plenty rooms at the bottom 
means like whatever we know at the bottom like in the atomic scale or in the molecular scale there are still plenty of things which actually can surprise us okay and so we believe actually from that point actually we started thinking of like if there is something which can be like in the nanoscale region whether some different types of materials is possible yes so like they are actually he was discussing about like the why cannot we write the entire 24 volume of encyclopedia britannica on the head of a pin okay so that the sentence that gives the birth of the concept of machines to make smaller machines or the concept of molecular machines and this penman's hypothesis so now a, it's a practical reality because now like a lot of people now working on that bottom room so like where they actually bring the atoms very close to each other not only to make them but also to make the nanometer so that's why he is known as the father of the modern nanotechnology and he gave uh, he, uh, he got the nobel prize in 1965 okay but it was actually not the pain man it was actually the taniguchi is a japanese scientist in 1974 he actually first coined the term nanotechnology so nanotechnology where he explains the nanotechnology is a type of material where we can actually manipulate a single atom or a single molecule from the surface so that means we can atom by atom or molecule by molecule we can modify the particle surface which actually is known as the nanoscale materials okay so the history of nanomaterials is very rich so because like the nano science it's not like the last century it has started it actually started actually long long back okay in a recent publication okay so it's a authentic publication from scientific reports in 2020 we came to know that the first reported nanomaterials which is a carbon material actually we found in india it's known as kiladi the kiladi is a place in tamil nadu it's near the sangam age time okay in the bank of river bhaigai okay so that's department of archaeology government of tamil nadu so they found actually there are some uh, 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 like pots made by mud so they are inside actually it was coated by fine carbon material and that was actually carbon dated of like 600 bc so that was still now that the first reported man made materials we could find in the down lane of the east okay now not only that like uh, you know might be like the robert carl so robert carl actually won the nobel prize for the kulati one of the recipients <clears throat> so he he once he told actually that the indian craftsmen and artisans so they used nanotechnology extensively about 2000 years back in the form of like pain okay so the pain so it was like uh, if you see like the in ajanta ilora so the paintings so those paintings the the like the animals paintings or the hand prints so those were made of nanomaterial so that's why those colors are still actually is persisting so it's it has not gone bad in this bad way that was so those was about like 2000 years back okay so this is the either the the prehistoric time or or close to that time so that was actually we could find those type of painting and then it was like second century to eighth century so there are several things and mostly you will find that the iron materials okay so the iron materials we we could make and those are like in delhi so the, there is a pillar in front of the kutub minar so which is like 7 meter tall and 6 ton okay but that pillar originally it was actually posted on 
Vishnupada hill. So that was in the Chandragupta Vikramaditya time. Okay. And that was the Tomar king Anangapal who brought it from the MP and then put it in the Delhi. And later actually it was uh, transferred to in front of the Kutub Minar. So that was a pure iron of 98%, but it was mixed to it about like 0.05% to 1% phosphorus. And it was it was so nice that it's not being corroded. So that corrosion and also it found that the, the top layer of this pillar, so that was actually coated with some kind of nanomaterials, which actually prevents the rusting. So not only in the this luminal uh, pillar, uh, the, you could find the nanomaterials or nanotechnology, but also there are like Koda Sadri. Koda Sadri is a place in Karnataka or Har in Mount Abu, okay, in MP, or Konark Sun Temple, Odisha. So there you see all the iron pillars, which are like about like uh, uh, almost like 2000 years back, they made those things or maybe 1500 years back, but still they have not been rusted. Okay, they are still remain in the original condition, so which is very surprising. And that's why like people are actually studying those things and found that there are some kind of nanomaterials actually embedded. Okay, in the form of carbon materials. Okay, so I'll I'll come in the form of like the Damascus steel. I'll explain what are those things. So, and then till now we used to know that the, the first man-made nice nanoparticles reported, it was actually the fourth century AD. Okay. The fourth century AD, which is one. Day. So that was the first nanoparticle, that's what most of the places actually people have reported that that was the first reported nanoparticle, which is not true. Now you know, like before Christ 600 BC also, we could find the nanoparticle. So this is a nice, but this is of course a, a wonderful example of the applications of nanomaterials. So they use these nanomaterials in the glass so that they can make actually a bioreflingent glass material. Okay. So what is so like they mix those nanoparticles? So the, most of the nanoparticles, which are like the silver and gold material, they put it in the glass. Where if you put a or sign the cup, which this is called the Lycurgus cup. So this Lycurgus cup, so this is they found in the Alexandria or Rome. Okay. So if you sign the light from outside, it looks green. But if you put a light or candle inside it, it looks red or it appears as red. But not only that, but if you can see in the right hand picture that the is that the chase portion so that is actually pink so you think like the how nicely they have incorporated the material so that the glass is is looking red but the king's chest is looking pink okay so this red color is is coming from mostly from the gold okay so gold absorbed in the green and it gives a uh, complementary color as red, as most of the times you know the gold nanoparticles, they look red, okay, spherical particles. And the, the green color is coming actually by absorbing light in the violet region, and that's why it appears as green. So these materials, they made of silica, which is 73.5 percent, and Na2O about like 14% and 6% lime and also of course they put 0.9% K2O okay and this is actually in the which time actually so that was like the time uh, time of Constantinople or even the Chandragupta Maurya's time okay so that time actually they made these nanomaterials marble so accurately and so nicely Okay, in the later part, so like in the 9th century to the 17th century. So that was actually, so it was a great influence of Ottoman techniques. 
So the Ottoman techniques, which is what you can do, like the, the uh, Turkish uh, influence. So that time they made all the, the, the like uh, glittering utensils, their painting, okay, or the charge painting, all sort of the Renaissance time. So that all come in this time period, 9th to the 17th century. Okay. So how they looks like you can see like the how nicely they have painted the utensil. Okay. So these are the Deruta ceramics. So that was in the Renaissance period. It came around like 1450 to 1600 AD. Okay. So it it's very often you can find in Italy. Okay, so they, those are actually the resultant of 5 to 100 nanometer silver nanoparticle. Okay, you can see like different colors like green, cyan, yellow, red. So they, those colors actually come from different diameters of different silver nanoparticle. And they have nicely embedded in the ceramics. Okay, now you will see so like those shores we call as the Damascus shore, but those actually originally invented by the Indians about like 2000 years back okay so those shores so those are so sharp that even if a silk if you put it down onto the sword edge a silk which doesn't have any way that also can cut into two parts okay so they are so sharp even you can actually cut the metal by this sword or even blade by this sword but their edge is will not actually bend or discharge in okay and they are so flexible that you can even actually bend them about like 90 degrees so completely you can bend it 90 degrees but the sword will not deform it so this huge strength and flexibility of these Damascus sword, which we call now as Damascus sword, but those are originated in India. Okay. And one such type of Damascus sword was with Tipu Sultan, okay, who brought it back from England. So those actually comes from the embedding of carbon material. So those are like cement type or iron carbide and carbon nano. So those actually gives them that flexibility and also so stable that they are they don't actually rust if you keep it in the normal weather. Okay. Not only that, in Europe, most of the churches, so their glasses are painted by nicely by red, yellow, green color paint. And those paints we found now actually comes from the nanoparticles. So those nanoparticles, it could be gold or silver and sometimes copper. So you can see in the team pictures. So the, the team pictures, the left hand side are the gold particle and right hand side are the silver particle. As you can see, as the size increases from 25 nanometer to 50 nanometer to 100 nanometer, their color also changes from red to green to yellow. So if you simply control their size so then you can nicely change their color similarly the silver also like if you reduce their sizes from 100 nanometer to 40 nanometer or again 100 nanometer so then you can also tune their color so you see the 100 nanometer if it is spherical which is yellow but 100 nanometer if it is a plate like a film so then the color is Red. So you see, if the dimension remains same, but the shape changes, then also color change. Okay. So which I'll I'll come later. So this is one of the most interesting property of the map. So not only these charges. So you will see the like rose windows of Notre Dame de Paris. So that was like one year or two years back. There it got fire. So it's. The windows are so beautiful and those actually the brilliant colors actually comes from the nanomaterial spin. And then in the modern age, the first scientific exploration of nanomaterial, which actually starts from the Michael Faraday study. 
and michael faraday in 1857 he actually generates the most famous nanomaterials in the history i'd say so that's we call as the ruby gold so that actually still in uh, british museum so they they actually preserved it and that it seems the color is still remain same that ruby gold so it's about like uh, more than uh, 250 years okay so still it's remain constant so as we can see in the timeline so like people knew now about like 600 bc indians they used to use the carbon nanomaterials in their utensils okay as a coating okay, for their stability and then even in the fourth uh, the ad that the romans they used to make the lighter gas car okay and then medieval churches window then from their 9th to 7th century islamic world lassars or renesa pottery and then finally the damascus swords and finally the modern age we come into the ruby gold okay now these are all like the synthetic part but these small materials to see them so we need instrument so those instruments also started developing from that time so the first things comes like 1879 so the first comes the cathode ray oscilloscope then we invent in 1895 xrd 1928 sibiramon gets the ramon spectroscope then 1937 to see these particles in the nanometer scale we invented same okay most of the times we think that the tame has come before same but that's not true the same comes first and then the tame so then 1938 comes the transmission electron microscope 1937 scanning electron microscope then 1969 it comes the x-ray photoelectron spectroscope and then scanning tunneling microscope and then in 1982 it comes the afm atomic force microscope so those all these tools we have invented to see these nanometers or to study their properties so, so this is kind of like an event, how actually the, the invention has started, like from starting. So this, this timeline actually from the fourth century. So you can see how Michael Faraday and then like the near field optical microscope comes in 1928, along with uh, Ramon spectroscopy, then 1931, the team transmission electron microscope came. So you can see, so like the, this is a, just a picture of the transmission electron microscope, how it looks. Okay, I I am sure like few of you already have seen that how the same machine looks like. But the thing is that it's not only the machine, but the its enormous ability to visualize a nanoscale material, which may be less than ten nanometer, or even maybe in the like half ten nanometer. Okay, like maybe one nanometer, two nanometer particle also, we can now image so easy. So this is few of the nanomaterials, where you can see those are the sharp tips of the nanoparticle. And each one of these, this is one of my own developed nano. So one of these tips, when we go for a high resolution transmission electron microscope, you can see that inside the tip, how the gold atoms are arranged. So that means the transmission electron microscope has improved in such a great extent. Now you can visualize each and individual atom. Okay, so that's the marvel, and then we know exactly how a nanomaterial be developed. Okay, which was the first invented this term by the Max Noll, who is a German electrical and Ernst Ruska, the German physicist. In, interestingly, like in 1931, they started. And then after that, Ernst Ruska continued his research, but Max Noll, I don't know where he left. And then finally, the Nobel Prize uh, offered to Ruska in 1986. So, 
so they have to wait for like 50 years okay to get the node back okay so the principle of the transmission electron microscope where it's it's very simple like most of the times we know like how the energy and wavelength they depend on each other so it's like e equals to h mu which is equals to h c by lambda so the lambda we can actually write mathematically as h c by e okay now h c if you uh, multiply the, the c the velocity of light and h is the Planck's constant in electron volt nanometer uh, so then it will come around 24 divided by eb okay so like if you use an electron beam so here the, in the uh, you see the thing is like when we use an optical microscope we we use a light beam to visualize that okay now the thing is like most of the times the light beam for visualization we use in the visible light so say about like its uh, wavelength is 500 nanometer so anything in the diffraction limit we can actually find or resolve two particles separate from each other about like 250 nanometer but the thing is here you are trying actually to find out the dimension of the nanometer whose length scale is like 10 nanometer so that means by using light microscope we cannot actually visualize it so that means we need something else which can actually give a much better resolution than optical so for that we used actually electron beam because electron beam the wavelength is in the picometer scale so that means we can actually go to the resolution in the picometer scale but so the nanometer resolution is not a problem so depending on the electron beam energy, so which is your E. So if you put one kilo electron volt, okay, then a simple calculation, you can find out that for one kilo electron volt electron beam, we can get a wavelength of 1.2 nanometer. So that means we can actually get a resolution of like 0.6 nanometer. So similarly, if I go a normal tape nowadays so which is 120 kilo electron volt which has lambda in the picometer scale and now we have 300 or 400 kilo electron volt thing so there that actually the resolution can go to the subatomic level and how a team looks you see that in the team so we are not using a light beam but rather we are using an electron beam so that means we need an electron beam generator so we use a filament which is basically an electron gun okay now for electron or the optical microscope we can focus the light by using the glass or quad lens very easily but how you can focus an electron beam by glass or quad lens we can so we need actually a magnetic Okay, so that's why it has several magnetic lens. So you see the first magnetic lens, which actually focus the electron beam and focus it onto the sample. This here is the sample. And then from there, the transmitted beam actually now again focused or defocused, which gives you the magnification and put into the image plate. Okay. So by depending on the different extent of focusing or defocusing, we can actually magnify the uh, image and we can get a different levels of image. Similarly, like the scanning, we develop the scanning electron. You see the difference between the same and same. The same, the images are all two dimensional, most of them. But nowadays there are tomography facilities are there where we can get actually a 3D spectra, a 3D image by rotating the sample in different angles. But same, where the electron beam actually scan over X, Y, and Z. So that's why we can get a, their 3D topology. So you can see such a nice uh, structure. So these are from the pollen grain. Okay, so how we can actually image different small scale material by using scanning electron. Now the 
the same or same for both cases we use actually the electron beam so if you just look at the electron beam and when it passed through a material you see when it passed through it has several regions and each region actually gives you different different spectrum from the top layer where you are actually you want the morphology of the materials you can actually focus on same but when you want to transmit the beam to the sample and wants to get their interior details their atomic arrangements and other things so that time you can get the same transmission rate from micro so that means for the same the beam has to go through the sample okay it has to transmit to the sample you can get transmission rate from micro okay so then once we achieved all these things so then it came like the people started actually synthesizing different different nanoparticles so it was first like 1977 richard van richard p van duven okay so he first developed the nanomaterial based surface enhanced chromoscopy okay and then uh, like 1983 lewis bruce and several other scientists they first actually formulated the quantum dots okay and then 1985 richard smelly okay so they invented the uh, c60 okay but they got the nobel prize in 1996 okay but they started their work in 1984 85 right? 1986 where we first actually developed the atomic force micro okay and then uh, in 1991 to 1993 so that was the time of easy okay to develop the carbon nano that both the initially he made the uh, multi walled carbon and then uh, developed the single wall carbon initially he made the multi walled carbon so this was one of the quantum dots okay the quantum dot is nano particles and the quantum dot so the quantum dot means the particle sizes should be so small that it should show the quantum effect means the here the states the valence states and the conduction states so those states are not like continuous but rather they are discrete so that you can actually excite them and from there you can even record their emission so most of the quantum dots that's why they are nicely fluorescent okay but the same phenomena we don't see actually for the nanoparticle so that was the alexi ikimo and then alexander efors and luis bruce these three scientists so they made this quantum dots the first two are the russians and the third one is the american okay so the alexi actually first uh synthesize the quantum dots in glass matrix okay and alexander efforts so who get the theory of the quantum dots and lewis bruce actually mostly works on metallic quantum dots okay uh, i'm not going into details how but like the, you see how actually we can selectively excite them we call it the photoselective excitation from the valence state or the ground state to the first excited state and then after the relaxation we call the internal relaxation so from the lowest vibrational state it can actually comes down to the ground state which and as a result they give the fluorescence okay and then once they they discovered this uh, quantum dots so in the same times also people started thinking about carbon nano and it was actually this group of uh, uh, steno brand so you, you can see this picture so these are the five fellows okay who are steno brand richard smelly robert carl harry proto and james heath you see out of this steno brand the left most one and the james heath the right most so these two are the students okay and the middle three these are robert carl 
left left one is the robert carl and then harry croto and smell okay so they they are actually are the scientists okay from different universities so they initially like in 1984 it was carl and croto so they met in texas in a symposium and they were discussing about that whether we can do something of carbon materials in the nanometer scale okay so carl collaborator of smell okay so carl uh, uh, and then uh, carl and croto so they discussed about this project but the thing is smelly was not very interested to take part in it okay but somehow actually croto finally convinced him that we can actually do a much better job by collaborating with each other okay. i personally met with harold croto a uh, very familiar and known as the harry croto in 2009 while i was so the so they performed their first experiment in august 23 1985 so this was actually like uh, what is the experiment so they wanted actually to find out what type of carbon materials forms if you excite them at very high temperature like the temperature of star okay so they ablate the or they, they heat it by a near infrared laser to a carbon substrate and then evaporate it which forms different different material okay so they found actually that some unknown molecules okay in presence of uh, carrier gas and proto wrote something quite remarkable taking place an odd peak in the mass spectroscopy measurement of the molecule that formed in the thing so they found that so initially they they were looking by mass spectrometer and they found actually a unusual intense peak is coming around c60 and c70 so they were thinking that what is is going on like something is forming and then the scene uh, they found actually that with an exclamation mark that understanding uh, the underlying the entry in the notebook that something is actually remarkable is happening and later actually they found that yes these are actually the the c60 or c70 and their structure looks like a bucky ball okay and uh, later uh, sino brian took a distinguished uh, member technical staff at texas institute and james see the new and you also from different okay. but once this invention comes like the this uh, bucky ball so then scientists actually started actually making different different types of carbon ball. so now might be you have you know like few of them like nano diamond okay and then the carbon onions okay nano horn okay and then recently people are uh, concentrating their activities on carbon dots okay because those are fluorescent and then uh, there is a huge research is going on in the field of graphene okay or single wall carbon nanotube multi wall carbon nanotube. So those are all active carbon materials and then all this research actually started after the invention of the c60 okay so how they looks like a single wall so single wall it's a single roll of graphene c so that's a single wall. and multi wall is a multiple roll with a concentric way if several layers of graphene comes together so then actually it gives a multi but both of them are invented by g okay so then in 1984 so that's the time actually so the invention of afm okay the thing is like you see for both same and thin okay so both we use a electron beam for the visualization of a material in an atomic scale okay but the thing is to do that one you have to keep the sample inside the vacuum okay and also if you keep it inside the vacuum so the real time they are grow or in the biological material so that's not a very favorable environment okay now how we can do it in the normal weather like uh, just in environmental condition whether we can image something 
in a great details like in the atomic scale yes it can be made and for that actually the invention of the afm so afm is a simply a mechanical imaging technique where you can see this one the left hand bottom side so you see a cantilever with a tip okay so there is actually it drag or it tap on the material okay and how actually it bends so that actually we can measure by focusing a small nrd laser beam on the tip and from the deflection if we image it in a 3d we can get an image so these are like the few images of dna chain so the dna chain which is a diameter of like 2.5 nanometer so easily we can image so that means even actually we can image something whose diameter or the length scale is almost like about a nanometer also we can very easily we can image them by using the afm okay and also like later the scanning tunnel microscope came where you can manipulate their atom you see how nicely a, a stm image of silicon 111 plane so like how the six atoms they are surrounded so nicely and also not only that you can actually manipulate the atom so you can bring the atom and then put it on something so that's what they did actually like xenon atoms with the samsung nickel 110 so you can nicely you can place them onto a plane and they have these research they have conducted in IBM. So you can, they, they have tried actually to put the genome atoms positioned on nickel 110 uh, plate and load the IB. Okay. So once those things come, so now actually the system is ready actually to visualize because we have now transmission electron microscope, we have now scanning electron microscope, we have AFM atomic force microscope, so we can visualize them. We can find out their crystal arrangement. So once people actually found out that yes, we can if we can make the material in the nano scale, visualization is not a problem. So once you can visualize them, so you you know their dimensions, their crystal arrangements, how they looks like shapes. Okay, now the spectroscopic things also has been explored nicely like in even 1928 uh, uh, ramon actually invented the ramon spectroscopy so all the absorbance fluorescence ramon everything has been invented so the people now have started actually concentrating on designing nanometer so initially what the people they they tried to make they, they were trying actually to make the simplest structure which is a sphere like a spherical part okay so that's what you can see the leftmost corner so those were the first gold nanoparticle made by Kukevich in 1951 apart from of course uh, Arades, uh ruby gold so there that was by using a ligand stabilization so Kukevich made 1951 gold nanoparticle you can see there's this uh, uh, inset actually gives that how actually individual nanoparticle looks. So they look nicely spherical part. Okay, but their diameter is about like five to ten. Okay. In 1951, and after that, it was not very the people were not was much interested about synthesizing things. But it started actually in the later part of 2000. The starts from 2000. So then 2000, Marty, uh, Catherine J. Marty in Rice University, so who first actually made the carbon rod, uh, the gold rods, okay, gold nano rods. Okay. And those gold nano rods later, she actually can increase their length, increase their diameter, they can make assemblies. A lot of things actually uh, started by Catherine Marty. So that was a high time actually people started actually exploring more and more about that. in 2003 at the same time chad mitkin just a simple photo uh, um, excitation from the teeth particle he made the silver nanoprism it's a very different structure 
and then immediately in 2008 he made how the prism we can actually transfer into a hollow prism or even to a ring okay and then 2010 unan sia from georgia tech he made silver nanotube you see how beautiful nanotubes are there and then mirkin made 2011 ikasu hetra okay it's all this structure either they varying the different synthetic condition or using different types of seeds or by adopting different growth mechanism they made different different nanoparticles and the similarly in the same time also we also started making things okay where we can made nano stars we can make nano plates or hollow nano prisms where each hollow plate there is a hollow at the center of that we made silver nano wires as like a 50 to 60 micron long okay we could make nice nano flowers we can make nano hedgehog hedgehog nano particle means like the it's the structural structurally it looks almost similar like a hedgehog which which is an animal you can find in the desert so they have a very sharp uh, horn on their back so those Uh, this type of materials with a tip diameter of like one to two nano, or even actually we can make hybrid uh, mesh from these nano rods. Okay, so but the thing is like uh, the, the what is the actually like the how like we define a nano particle? Okay, so that is what is the nano science. So if you see like how they are different from the atoms or molecules. Okay, you can see like the, if we just take a gold atom, suppose the leftmost one, the gold atom you can see when you excite, you get a discrete states or discrete uh, atomic spectrum. Okay, similarly, like when you go for like a gold metal or some material, okay, so then instead of this discrete spectrum. you will see like it, it has some band structure so that means the states are not any more discrete but rather they are continuous okay so or a band structure okay so based on that we can divide them to a metal insulator semiconductors or semi metal but in between what is there so like when the atoms are few atom they comes close to each other they make a clusters or nanoparticle so you can see that it doesn't have a very sharp atomic spectra type of spectra or like a band structure but rather it has a different step spectra okay and depending on their number of peaks range we can actually infer like what type of materials actually we can form and like whether we can make arrangement of any number of atoms and make a nanoparticle or no there are some selection rules that yes we can only bring two atoms and make a cluster or maybe 250 atoms to make a nanoparticle so to explore that actually we will have work like a uh, on the small clusters okay so to understand that actually we have to understand the electronic configuration so like atoms the electronic configurations of atom you can easily you can derive from the four this uh, these rules like above principle pauli exclusion and ohm's rule how actually the atomic self uh, the atomic orbital actually they fit so you know like the energy increases from 1s to 2s to 2p to 3s to 3p okay so that's the way the electronic configurations we can derive but the same thing is not true when more than one similar atom so like two gold atom or 10 gold atom or you know, 1000 gold atoms comes close to each other or one sodium two sodium five sodium 10 sodium they comes to close to each other so they have suppose if you consider a sodium sodium has a valence electron only one outside cell so that one atom contribution from each atom now when 10 atoms comes close to each other and try to make a cluster whether that will make a cluster or not okay so that one actually we can find out from the cell model and how actually the electronic configuration happens 
so that can easily you can find out from this diagram so you can see that each red arrow define one one cell. so that means one s is one complete cell then go to one p is the second cell and then you see the third row arrow is one d two s so that is the third cell then fourth one is one f two p okay then fourth one is 1g 2d 3s which i wrote in the right hand side like first cell is 1s2 second cell 1p in the p there are maximum six electrons it can hold so that's why it's six so the first cell there are two electrons and these two electrons comes from the two atoms so that means the first stable clusters we can get by combining two atoms okay like NAP. Okay, the second full cell has six electrons. So the total will be eight. So that means eight sodium can come and make a sodium eight a cluster. Third cell, which is 1D10 2S2, total 12 electrons. 12 plus 6 plus 2, so 12 plus 6, 18 plus 2, so 20. So 20 atoms of sodium can come close to each other and make a complete cell. So we can easily we can get a sodium 20 nanocluster. So like that, so these are we call as like magic numbers. Okay. So the first first complete cell is two, second is eight, third is 20, fourth is 40, fifth is 70, sixth cell is 120. So this one actually experimentally also being proved. Okay. While I was in uh, uh, USA, I was uh, studying in the DIA tech. So that time I used to, so this is a story. Yes. So like, I, I used to see this person. So he used to sit below a maple tree and he used to smoke. Okay. Most of the time with a cup of coffee, he is sitting there. So one day I asked one of my friend that, who is that man? Then he told, oh, you don't know, he's a famous person. He's uh, Walter B. Hill. He's a, he's a Dutch person, Dutch physicist. Okay, I said, why he is famous? You don't know that you are working on nanoscience, but he is the first one actually who actually proved that the cell model of nanoclusters is actually right to the mass spectrum. His recorded mass spectra looks like this. So you can see there is a clear visible peak star at 8, 20, 40. You see, like the magic numbers of like 8, 20, and 40. So these are from the sodium cluster. So you can see mass spectrometrically also, we can easily prove that the abundance is maximum when the cluster size at 8, 20, 40, 58, or 60. Okay. So those are the magic numbers by which there is a complete cell. <laughs> So now we we can actually find out that how actually these magic numbers are formed. So the, at the same time, actually, so these are the like the chemists and physicists. They were trying actually to develop nanomaterials in two different ways. Okay. So one we generally call as the physicist way, another is the chemist way. So the physicist way, so generally they always uh, go for like a top down means. You have a big material, so like a, this is a bulk material, which actually they make it fragments, and those fragments finally fragmentation after fragmentation, and then finally it comes into the nanoscale structure. So that's why you call it a top down. But the chemists who are very familiar with atomic and molecular uh, reagent, so they try to actually build from the smallest part and try to go to the the higher dimension so they starts from the atom or molecule they make clusters and when the clusters they couple to each other they finally make the nanoparticle so one actually the dimension reduced to nanoscale and another actually dimensions of atoms or molecules increases to the nanoscale that's why we call these two as top down and bottom -up. Now the top down, so there are several methods. Okay. So several methods like one is the mechanical method. 
the milling is like it's a kind of a grinder so if they actually rotate in different directions okay so then you can actually grind the materials and make the smaller and smaller particles so the these these are the different geometry like one is the head on impact one is the oblique impact and the multiball uh, milling so with a big uh, ball and there are several smaller balls if they rub against each other so you can make a smaller fragment and there are also so by this ball milling method we can actually go for finer milling so this is the fine milling which is range about like 100 micron to 10 micron but ultra fine milling which is about like 10 micron to 1 micron so so you see the, the by using this technique it's very difficult to go the dimension of the particle or simply the um, uh, top down method we cannot actually synthesize anything below one micron okay to the volume so then to avoid this one actually people started actually photolithography photolithography is very simple it has three steps first actually we coat with the material and then we expose with the uv light okay and then we develop okay so by that way we can make different different masks and in this mask, the whatever the, the the size or shape of the mask, so it will only expose the UV light to those, and it will give a kind of like imprint onto the coating. Okay, but the problem is that this one is is a very complex and expensive. Okay, so it's not very cost effective also. Okay, so then people started actually building the electron beam lithography. You see, here the electron beam, as, as I explained, the electron beam in the electron wavelengths are in the picomere. So it has very less diffraction. Okay, or the diffraction limit is also very small. So you can use the electron beam as like a pin. And then as you want, you can just write on to a minute. Okay. But again, this is also very, very expensive. And also, you cannot make a bulk amount of material by using the electron beam. But then, actually, came as nanosphere lithography. This is a wonderful technique where you just take a clean substrate, as I have shown on the left hand side. And then on the top, you just drop cast with some balls. Okay. So those are we call as the microspheres. Okay, it could be polystyrene balls. Okay. So now once you drop cast it and then try to evaporate or the dry the sample, so the the solvent will dry up. Once it dry up, these polystyrene balls they will come close to each other in a close pack fashion. They will arrange onto the substrate. But since the these particles are sphere, so between the spheres, there are some gaps. Now, if you put a silver or gold coating, so then through these pores, silver or gold can leak through and it will give an imprint into the, on the clean surface. And then you peel off the balls, so the left will be the silver or gold island. So as you can see from the, this AFM, how nicely this, uh, silver or uh, gold uh, uh, drops are actually nicely. But this one also, like, uh, it only can generate a specific pattern, it's not as you wish. So then, actually, instead of these methods, people started actually using the focusing uh, by like ion beam. Okay, the ion beam, like. So that means that ion beam has to be it's it's a molten metal so that acts as the ion beam and as like a pen you can write okay if you see in the, the periodic table so there are like 118 elements out of which only few are actually are molten condition what are the materials are molten condition so those are like bromine and then uh, uh, gallium so most of the times we use a gallium ions as the ion beam for the ion beam. 
and then mercury cesium and calcium so only five elements are there uh, which are liquid condition okay and there are 11 gas and rest is actually solid so the, our periodic table is full of solids so the universe is also is pretty much solid okay so these are the the things like the like the top down methodology we can use to synthesize the nanoscale but then the chemists and of course yes fine biologists also so they actually adopts the bottom okay so where the bottom up so you can the the, the good thing of bottom up actually like you can atomic scale you can manipulate okay so that you can generate nanomaterials by using self assembly or even you can use a focus uh, electron beam and then manipulate the atoms okay or synthetically you can make them you can add the atom by atom or molecule by molecule you can synthesize them into a nanoscale okay. so how we generally the, this is a diagrammatically we can explain so the top down method so from the pulp we can make the powder and from there nanoparticles and if still if we can uh, 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 disintegrate them maybe once we can reach into the atom but in nanoscale uh, in uh, uh, top top down and the, in bottom up bottom up case so where actually we use different metal precursor and different blocking agent with the design reducing agent and surfactant so these combinations actually we can make seeds or even we can use those seeds to grow a much bigger nanobite how it comes it's like mostly like you see like this is a specific example for silver nano where the silver ions we first actually reduce them so silver ions reduce to silver atoms now the silver atoms in presence of surfactant here the surfactants acts like a cement or glue so they bring few atoms to make the smallest particle which we call as the seed now those seeds actually acts as the seeding agents like how we make yogurt from milk so in the milk we put little yogurt and then each yogurt actually used as the seed to make the whole milk into the yogurt so similarly here also few seeds they actually bring the silver atoms close to each other and make a much bigger particle to the association and makes the perfectly formed spherical or different other shapes of nanoparticles but the, why these nanoparticles are so interesting because nanoparticles have few specific very interesting properties what are these properties they have size dependent properties they have shape dependent properties okay so size dependent means similar particle made by the same metal or something so they depending on their size they shows different different properties optical properties magnetic properties or electrical properties they shows different shape different same materials but as their shape changes their property changes okay. higher quenching efficient so these nanoparticles that they acts like a quencher what type of quencher like a fluorescence quencher so the a fluorophore can transfer a huge amount of fluorescence energy to this nanoparticle and so that's why they acts like a quencher very good point so and their quenching ability is like a five orders more than the common organic dye. So that means even you can reduce its concentration up to five orders, and still you can get the same extent of quench. They have extraordinary Raman activity. These nanoparticles, due to their electromagnetic field on their surface, so they actually enhance the field. And as a result, they act as a very good Raman activity. And they also, along with this Raman activity, they have a strong non-linearity. And also, 
we can very easily modify these nanoparticle surface. So easily we can use them for biomedical applications also, optical applications, materials applications, sensing tool. So different use actually we can do by using this nanoparticle. A few of them I will show this property. Like as you know, like this, this each nanoparticle they have their surface electrons which are free. Now once it's been so these free electrons they oscillate. Now when we actually excite it by an electromagnetic radiation, so this electric field oscillating electric field of the radiation they also enforce the electron or the external electrons of the nanoparticle also oscillate in the same frequency so as a result of that we get a surface plasma so the surface plasma of the surface electrons that coherent collective oscillations which gives a absorbent which we call as the surface plasma okay. and depending on that as most of you know like that if you consider a particle in a box so depending on the length of the box which is the dimension of the particle so as the dimension of the particle increases so the energy also reduces and hence we will get an absorbance band in the red region so you can see just simply changing the dimensions of the particle we can actually move the absorbance band as you can see this black one and the blue one these both these two are spherical but you see the dimension the first black one is the smaller and the blue one is larger so the box length is actually increasing so that means energy is reducing and also we can expect a red band shifting okay or shifting of the absorbent band in the red band. so that's why there is a slight movement in the red band now if we consider like three rod nano rod so then it has two dimensions one is the longitudinal another is the transverse you see the longitudinal as the length increases so that means box length is increasing so the energy will reduce so that's why these bands actually keep on moving towards the right hand side okay and this one is beautifully shown here it is simply we are changing the diameters from a to a so where a is only 15 nanometer okay and f is how much f f is 294 nanometer so it's about almost like 300 nanometer difference in dimension how nicely actually we can tune their absorbent from 500 nanometer to almost like 700 nanometer because their absorbance actually is shifting towards the red <clears throat> not only that like the i i just uh, Two slides back, I explained that they have hyper quenching property. You see, quenching generally we explain by thread, fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer, where a donor and acceptor, specially not through bond, yes, they specially they transfer their energy from the chlorophore to the quencher. Okay, now so the, that means donor to the acceptor. So now, if we remove the acceptor organic molecule. And then put a nanoparticle there. So that nanoparticle also now act as an acceptor. So now the fluorophore can easily transfer its energy to the nanoparticle. The difference of this organic fluorophore uh, based uh, donor acceptor and nanoparticle based difference is both the for organic one, the donor and acceptor, they are kind of like a point vector. So at a particular, so like when they are parallel to each other the vectors that time only energy transfer is maximum but for nanoparticles suppose this is a sphere they don't have like a specific vectorial direction so in any direction of the donor it can transfer its energy so the energy transfer efficiency is much more in case of nanoparticle based donor acceptor pairs so in the energy transfer efficiency mathematically we can explain by one by one plus r by r 0 to the power n so generally for organic molecule based donor acceptor n is 6 okay but for nanoparticle based donor acceptor pair it's actually 4 or we define as a slow distance dependent point okay and instead of freight we call as a nanoparticle 
surface energy transfer okay so or nse so how actually we can uh, design them is simply think about a dna chain one side it has a thiol linkage and another side is a fluoro but you know like the gold has a huge affinity towards thiol so easily it can attach in one end and another end fluorophore can actually loop back and fall onto the surface of the gold once it comes close to the gold surface it will immediately it will quench now the interesting like if we put a target dna which is complementary to this dna chain so they will make a hybridized and once it hybridized so this is kind of a rigid rod so they will come out from the surface and go away from the surface so as a result the quenching will be reduced so by recording we can actually find out actually how long is the complementary not only that the shape also is a factor okay how the shape actually changes so like there are several factors like simply you think about the viscosity and change so here it's a long back we did some experiments like simply we are changing the viscosity by increasing the concentration of the surface so once you increase the viscosity so that means the movement of the gold atom also will be slowed down so once it slows down so their crystallization will be much more patterned and they will give a more directed nanometer so you see like at the beginning this one it looks like a flower shape that's because here actually the concentration of the surfactant is least so that's why these gold atoms are very free so they comes from all the direction and makes a totally isotropic part and as the concentration increases so they are becoming more and more directed nanopart and finally it gives at the highest concentration of the surfactant here it is ctel ctel prime thiol ammonium bromide and we can make the gold nanoparticle as bipyramid which is very close to the rod not only that by simply changing their blocking like which facets you wants to in suppose you wants to make it all so what you will do you will do like the side face you will close and then only the front face of the rod you wants to do so that's why so that we can do by increasing the concentration of blocking agent by forming silver chloride in the medium and we can change their aspect ratio and not only that as you can see like their property also change with the surface to volume ratio surface to volume ratio means you see as the particle diameter changes so their surface the rate of increment of the surface and rate of increment of volume are not proportional so volume increases much more rapidly than surface so that's why surface to volume ratio reduces so think about like a 6 nanometer particle where the surface to volume ratio is 1 nanometer inverse but same material a 12 nanometer where the surface to volume ratio is 0.5 nanometer so that means for the bigger particle the relative surface area exposed of per unit volume is reduced by half so that means this particle is not as active as the small particle again if we consider the two rods which has different length but have the same dimension then the surface to volume ratio it depends only on the diameter not the volume that means their surface to volume ratio remains constant so that's why different length of nanoparticle their catalytic activity almost remains same also it depends on the sharpness of the tip so these different nanoparticle has different different Tips. So some tips are very sharp, some are not very sharp. So that tip curvature, which we define as the R or a yeah, one by R or by kappa. So as the sharp thickness or the curvature of the tip increases, their catalytic activity also increases. Not only that, its surface charge is also play a very big. What is the, how we measure? we measure by dynamic light scattering so we basically this is the the potential difference between this 
this fixed layer and the bulk layer so where all the ions are all dispersed so that potential difference gives you the zeta bond okay if that zeta potential of the particle is is more so that means the charges are concentrated more onto the surface and as a result actually one nanoparticle will repel to the other nanoparticle so they cannot come close to each other so it will not agree so as a result these particles will remain stable so that's why anything any nanoparticle with a zeta potential greater than 30 millivolt so they are pretty stable in the solution so when we synthesize nanoparticle we try actually to make nanoparticle with a much higher zeta potential so that it remains stable for a long time okay. the surface to volume ratio we can simply explain by considering a hexagonal closed pack structure or face center cubic structure you see hexagonal closed pack means with a central atom in the surrounding there are six atoms and in the top layer there are three atoms and the bottom layer are two three atoms so total 12 atoms surrounded by a single central atom and the same thing for the face center cube now you see like the first cell so that means one central atom and outside there are 12 atoms okay total number of atom is 13 and then exposed surface atom is 92 percent and then for the second cell exposed surface atom is only 76 percent and if you go on increase this way then when you reach the seventh cell the exposed atom is only 35 percent okay so that means the exposed atom exposed portion of surface atom has reduced okay and not, not only that how they pattern like whether they are in simple cube or a center cube or body centered cube depending on that so they they are packing also change like in a simple cube the central one the packing is only 52.4 percent because a single cube in simple cube it has only one but for a body centered cube it has effectively per unit cell there are two atoms and that's why the packing fraction increases to 68 percent but if you think about the face centered cube so it has 74 percent packing so those are much more packed way they are formed okay so depending on that their catalytic activity also changes so depending on their packing their the simple cube has a coordination number six but body center cube has a coordination number of eight and face center cube has coordination number 12 so as I showed, like the each central atom is surrounded by 12 atoms for body center. Now, uh, face center and body center cube is surrounded by 8 atoms and simple cube surrounded by 6 atoms. Okay. Now, when we consider different portion of the material, like from an edge to a corner to the ball, how actually coordination number changes? We already explained for a hexagonal closed pack or face center cube, the bulk atom has coordination number 12. But this is not true for the face atoms because face atom, so the face layer, the three atoms are missing. So the coordination number is only 9. Now if I consider the 2D plane, so that means top and bottom layers are missing. So it has only 6 coordination number. And corner atom, so that has only 5 because it has one more atom is actually missing. Okay. So, <clears throat> now due to this coordination change, their activity also changes. So, think about it this is a bulk material and the top layer, there is no other atoms to balance the force. So, those top layers will be catalytically more active. And also, as the dimension of the particle reducing, 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 you will see the metal melting point also reduces okay and uh, not only that once we reduce the dimension and goes down to a structure where actually they form a small domain so these are mostly seen, seen for the magnetic material so once we reach the inner magnetic materials most of the time the magnetic materials they are non-magnetic that's because 
these magnetic moments are randomly oriented so they cancel each other but think about the dimension is now changing and reducing reducing and finally you could make a single domain material where all the magnetic moments are aligned to a particular direction so then there will be a super magnets okay so that's what like this is one of the uh, uh, magnetic materials when we actually uh, uh, from the molten materials we cool down below the Curie temperature and then took a same uh, uh, structure so then you can see the different zones so these different zones are due to different magnetic properties of different so this is the single domain magnetic materials okay and depending on their magnetic moments in new directions also we can actually think about which are like the magnetic materials okay the magnetic materials so there are several different types of material, magnetic materials what are those things like diamagnetic paramagnetic ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic the, the interesting thing is when we make a nanoparticle and then once we reduce their dimension as we can see and we measure the coercivity so coercivity is 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 like the resistance of changing magnetization okay so that means magnetically they are stable so then once we reduce the dimension from a bigger particle to a smaller particle we reach to a dimension which we call the critical dimension so that has the highest coercive or it has a single domain where magnetism magnetization is very difficult to change but now once we still reduce the dimension then the coercivity actually changes and decreases fast and goes to almost so the magnetic materials also have different different properties depending on their susceptibility we can develop the different magnetic materials or we can couple with the plasmonic materials to go for a different plasmonic uh, magnetoplasmic so uh, these are the, the preliminary things which i wanted to discuss in the first class okay and based on those things those properties which i explained in my first lecture so i will go to the second lecture uh, day after tomorrow so where i will explain in more details about how we can synthesize what are the different protocols we can apply conceptually you can define or develop a protocol to synthesize uh, a different materials okay how we can develop their anisotropy what are their controlling parameters and finally i will explain once we develop all these nanomaterials how we can apply them for different purposes that could be for an optical material it could be for sensing it could be for theranostics okay uh, in the biomedical applications imaging materials so those things i will describe in my 26th class okay so on the 26th of november so um, so this is the end of uh, today's uh, lecture and again we will come back on 26th so if you have any question so you can please ask me okay thank you Do you have any question? We'll wait for some time. Let's see. Yeah.
So we have no question for today. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, sir. So I can uh, turn off, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay.